Power, Magnificence and Renaissance Diplomacy, The Field of the Cloth of Gold, 1520, by Sean Cunningham. By 1520, England and France had been at war for centuries. The Plantagenet grip on the English crown from the 12th century also brought rights to lordship over French territory that continued to be contested violently in the later medieval period. These wars had a major impact on politics and trade across Northern Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries especially. Periods of truce and peace had come and gone as treaties and marriage agreements tried to resolve the wars made by individual kings asserting their inherited rights in France. Most recently, English invasions happened in 1475 and 1492 with the aim of recovering control of Normandy. Through the award of war costs and large pensions, the French bought off Edward IV and Henry VII before any major battle happened. Henry VIII too came to the throne in 1509, eager to renew the Hundred Years' War in the hope of emulating the successes of English kings like Edward III and Henry V. For five months, from June 1513, Henry invaded France from the English base at Calais. He won a minor victory at the Battle of the Spurs on the 16th of August, and by the end of September had captured the town of Terouanne and the city of Tournai. Henry also was in a stronger position when France's ally, James IV of Scotland, was killed alongside most of his nobles and thousands of their men at the Battle of Flodden on the 9th of September 1513. The 1513 war with France and Scotland also had a wider context than historic Anglo-French hostility. It was part of a series of alliances to contain French aggression. In 1494, the French King Charles VIII had launched his armies across the Alps to claim the Kingdom of Naples. In England, Henry VII developed his country's role in negotiations surrounding this war, but it was not until 1511 that England under Henry VIII finally joined the Pope's Holy League to protect papal lands from France and her allies. England's formal role in the League and support for the Pope also opened up other ways for Henry and his leading advisor, Thomas Wolsey, to exert England's influence. The entangling war in Italy drew in many European rulers and undermined the Pope's bigger plans to halt the westward expansion of the Ottoman Empire through Eastern Europe. As the costs of rebuilding and running Tournai as part of England increased by 1518, Henry VIII was willing to return it to France in return for an annual payment or tribute which he took as acknowledgement of his victory over the French. An opportunity for a bigger peace plan emerged as Cardinal Wolsey directed these negotiations with France. Using his status as a personal representative of Pope Leo X, Wolsey engineered an agreement between England and France but also built broader plans for a permanent accord in Europe. During 1518, Pope Leo and Wolsey brokered a truce between conflicting countries and set up a mechanism for the Pope to arbitrate in the existing disputes between states, although Wolsey wanted to enhance his own and King Henry's role as a European peacemaker. Their efforts underpinned the universal peace that was agreed in London in October 1518. An agreement for the marriage of Henry's daughter Mary and Francois of Brittany, the Dauphin of France, underpinned Wolsey's vision of a move towards Anglo-French cooperation. He then spent the following two years planning a spectacular event centred on a meeting between Henry and Francis to ratify in person the sentiments expressed in the alliance agreed in London. Papal pressure to find a way to unite Christian countries in a common cause echoed the optimism that accompanied the accession between 1509 and 1516 of three dazzling young kings in Europe. These were England's Henry VIII, born 1491, Francis I of France, born 1494, and Charles V, ruler of Spain and the Netherlands, born 1500, who also became Holy Roman Emperor less than a year before the Field of Cloth of Gold took place. All were educated with the knowledge of the new humanist learning prevalent in Europe as classical texts were rediscovered and printed for the first time. With similar outlooks, but competing aims, balancing the individual power and prestige of these rulers became an important priority for diplomats in all three countries. Maintaining perceptions of parity and equality of status between rivals in time of peace was the best guarantee of avoiding war. In England, 
While Henry VIII wanted the glory of victory in war, by 1518 he was mindful of the risks and costs. He was also conscious that the greatest victory of his reign at Flodden had happened when he'd been out of the country. A more nuanced political approach was therefore needed if he was to achieve his ambitions. The field of the cloth of gold, held 500 years ago, therefore served a political end of peace but also demonstrated military preparedness through the mustering of the royal households, nobles, knights and their followers. It celebrated the treaties between England and France through the mock warfare of tournaments, but the military leaders of both countries were prepared to the very point of actual fighting. Charles V was literally peripheral to the event at the Field of the Cloth of Gold, having moved his court to the Burgundian frontier a few miles from the site of the Anglo-French gathering. Henry also held interviews with Charles before and after he met with Francis. The field therefore turned out to be an expensive interlude in the suspicion and competition between these most dynamic of kings in Europe. The Field of the Cloth of Gold was to be a visual reminder of Wolsey's achievement in bringing England and France together. It was important in building hope that a major political shift could be sustained by preserving the dignity and image of kingship short of war. In charge of the preparation of the site and immediate arrangements was the Chamberlain of Henry's royal household, his cousin Charles Somerset, Earl of Worcester. Somerset had served right through Henry VII's reign as a diplomat and captain of the King's Guard. He had been brought up during exile in France before 1485 and was experienced and capable in dealing with French nobles and officials. The queens and their households were also present at the field. The spirit of peaceful competitiveness also affected them. Although only 20 years of age, Claude was seven months pregnant with her fifth child in 1520. The Queen's households perhaps numbered 200 named officers and companions, but the numbers of servants brought expanded the numbers considerably. Accompanying Claude was the young Anne Boleyn, who was part of her household. The Queen's met on the 11th of June when they arrived to watch the start of the jousting. The Chronicle of Calais also suggests that they met each other regularly outside of the formal events, banquets and dances. Henry VIII and Francis I met at a temporary town of tents and portable buildings built between Guin and Arde in the Pale of Calais to house them, host meetings, banquets and dances, and accommodate thousands of their courtiers and servants. The Pale was an area of about 86 square miles around English Calais, bordering French Picardy and the lands of Charles V in Flanders. The event was a grand celebratory tournament, with all the trappings of outlandish wealth that two powerful national rulers could muster. We know what took place from the documents that sorted out the payments and costs, like this book of accounts of the King's Chamber in England. The colourful written report by the chronicler Edward Hall supplies real detail, and a picture painted almost 20 years later gives us a great visual reference of what went on. Again, from the chamber books, we can pick up some of the high level information of the costs and timescales needed to do the preparation work at Geen. The first entry here records the expenses of 100 carpenters, 50 glaziers and 24 painters sent with consignments of lead and tin to work on the buildings required for the field at Geen. The second entry shows payment to two men for making batons and garnishing the new house at Geen. And the final extract lists wainscote boards needed at Calais and some of the costs for making tents and a total of £3,599, 7 shillings and 10 pence spent by the King's Chamber in the first week of May alone. These records summarise the bills and costs drawn up by individual workmen or supervisors for the tasks they carried out. Most of this type of evidence has not survived, but where it does, for the officers of the armoury, kitchen, revels or wardrobe, we can see in minute detail the effort required to present Henry VIII in the magnificent way he expected. Of great interest at the time, and currently to staff at historic royal palace's Hampton Court, was Henry VIII's 
portable palace. It is described as the king's building in the records showing the build-up to the field, and it's depicted prominently in the Hampton Court painting. It was built outside of the gates of Guin and had four blocks of rooms around a central courtyard over two floors, with an elaborate staircase and a fountain of wine permanently running outside. The walls were brick up to about the height of eight feet and then timber framed up to 30 feet. As with many campaign buildings like bakeries and brew houses, it was a very sophisticated and elaborate version that was built in sections in England and shipped to its destination by sea. Did this picture remind an ageing Henry VIII of the high point of his chivalric magnificence in European affairs? Nevertheless, it's important to us as a record of what took place at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. The picture captures the key events of the meeting in a series of separate elements combined into one painting. In 1520, this was the most recent, unusual and magnificent of meetings between the King of England and a foreign ruler. In organisation, it had a direct connection to Henry VII's discussions for 10 days in May 1500 with Philip the Fair of Burgundy at St Peter's Church outside Calais. Elements two of Philip's unexpected journey to Windsor via shipwreck off Weymouth in January 1506 also informed how the English court prepared to meet with the French king 14 years later. Henry VIII had spent over £2,000 when hosting his ally the Emperor Maximilian for one month near Calais during the War of 1513, and earlier kings of England had held summits with their French cousins in lavish events that confirmed peace agreements. Many events were backed by chivalric entertainments in the form of grand tournaments. While it's possible that Henry VIII's council looked at accounts of what Henry III did in 1259 or Richard II accomplished in 1396, the field of the cloth of gold was in a league of its own as a celebration of the power and resources of late medieval European kingship. The scale and expense of the coming together of two courts was unprecedented. It was a massive undertaking for the administrators of the English royal household, chamber and wardrobe. The meeting lasted a little over two weeks, but required over a year's worth of intensive preparation and cost the crown most of the annual allowance for the king's household. Unlike the earlier Tudor summits, there was no formal intention that the 1520 event would produce major new diplomatic agreements over trade, military alliances or royal marriages. Those were already in place in 1518. It's clear, however, that negotiation and discussion, spying and intelligence went on at all levels when three courts and their personnel were in such close proximity. At face value, this grand tournament celebrated peace between old enemies and allowed Henry and Francis to demonstrate their physical prowess and royal dignity. Thanks to a joint project by the Universities of Winchester and Sheffield, in partnership with the National Archives, anyone can now search and browse the records of payment and income of the Tudor Royal Chamber between 1485 and 1521. The project has transcribed the contents of the account books of the Treasurer of the Chamber, which reveal how Henry VII and Henry VIII lived their lives among their servants and courtiers, and how early Tudor England was governed in peace and war. The field of the cloth of gold added a new dimension to international rivalry. Henry and Francis could make their own judgments about their respective power and kingship without the massaged opinions of ambassadors or intermediaries writing from afar. It put the figure of each king directly at the centre of how their country projected its influence. Very visibly, they embodied everything about their regime and personal authority. In fact, Francis insisted that the detail of the meeting should be left to clerks and administrators. The kings should enjoy pastimes and competition suitable for their superior rank and status. Such statements offer a different way to view how these kings wanted to be judged by their fellow rulers, but also how they presented themselves to their own aristocracy, servants and common people. The wealth of material gathered for such an extravagant projection of national strength and sophistication provides a wonderful snapshot of England's early 16th century cultural resources, social conventions, military innovations, fashion, building techniques and attitudes to food, drink and hospitality. 
Although distorted by the size of the undertaking as a peacetime substitute for military campaigning, the logistics and mechanics required to assemble all the parts of this event provide excellent information too on how the late medieval English state travelled to war. The kings were keen to test their physical prowess against each other, but the relative strength of their political power was demonstrated at their first meeting on the 7th of June. When Henry VIII's titles were cried by his King of Arms, the English claim to the Kingdom of France caused a moment of worry. Francis effectively brushed this off by implying that Henry could call himself what he liked. It would not change the reality of England's inability to conquer and hold on to the French lands or titles it claimed. Wolsey and Henry had worked hard to elevate England's position within the European diplomatic picture, but this was a reminder that any further building of reputation or greater prominence would require careful navigation around Francis I's power. Despite lengthy planning and negotiation, both rulers brought more troops than agreed. Until these two powerful kings met, the gathering remained precariously balanced between peace and war, a suspicion dominated the outlook of the military commanders on both sides. Artificial mounds were built up around a shallow valley to enable each nation to observe the other as it approached. A royal tent, set up by the English and decorated with cloth of gold and tapestries, marked the agreed meeting point. Each king approached slowly with three attendant courtiers, one of whom bore the sword of state. Both kings literally dazzled in clothes made from gold and silver thread, cut in the most fashionable styles and hanging with jewels, as evidenced in these records of purchases that gave the field its name. Even the English king's guard had gilded spears. These first impressions were important because they set the personal tone between Henry and Francis, from which the rest of their entourages would take their cue. In the weeks before the English and French kings began their respective journeys towards Guine and Ardes, final preparations and points of order were transmitted through Henry's ambassador at the French court, Sir Richard Wingfield. His report on the 3rd of May established the final agreements for the location of the initial meeting point and the form of the tournament that would be fought during the event. Francis agreed to travel into English territory on the condition that, as guests of Henry, he and his advisers controlled the conduct of the tilting, tourney fighting and duelling at the barriers. Wingfield put in a huge effort, working very closely with the Earl of Worcester and Thomas Wolsey to reach this agreement with Worcester's opposite commander, the Marshal of France, Gaspard de Coligny, Seigneur de Chastillon. The key element of the field was the chivalric competition between the knights and lords of both nations in the tournament. All the trappings of wealth, power and ingenuity present in the clothes, buildings and magnificent display were distilled into this main event. With so many prominent men in attendance, Limiting the numbers and opportunities to shine was one of the most pressing problems facing the organisers. It seems that between 200 and 300 English and French courtiers, including the two kings, put themselves forward to fight in one or more of the three competitions. Jousting individually with lances across the barrier or tilt, on horseback in the melee of the tourney, or on foot at the barriers. Each competition had its own rules on armour, weapons, point scoring, penalties and procedure, much of which had taken weeks to negotiate beforehand. Opportunities to fight had to be carefully managed to satisfy the honour and expectation of knights on both sides, so in a bid to include as many as possible, only eight passes at the tilt were allowed, with the obvious exception of both kings. Nevertheless, England's most experienced and skilled jousters got the chance to show their skills, including the Marquis of Dorset, the Earl of Devon, the Duke of Suffolk and Sir John Carew. As the Chronicle of Calais succinctly put it, and so these two kings met every day after at camp with diverse lords and there jousted and tourneyed 14 days, and the two queens met at Guines and at Ard diverse times. On the 9th of June, Henry and Francis started the tournament when they became co-leaders of a jousting team of defenders to compete over the next 10 days against 14 teams of 10 or 12 attackers. These groups were comprised of men from both countries of varying but evenly balanced rank. 
Challenges were made in one of the three combat games by touching the appropriate shield of the desired opponent on the Tree of Honour as depicted in the top right of the Hampton Court painting. No fighting took place on Sundays or Saints' feast days and combat did not start until the 11th of June when the Queens arrived to take their places as the focus for the chivalric competition. Henry and Francis both rode in the lists that day and, we are told, broke many lances to great acclaim. Wind and rain made tilting at the highest level difficult, but it did not prevent subtle and not so subtle messaging in the symbols and mottos displayed by the competitors on the costumes worn over their armour and on the horse trappings. On his first day of competition, for example, Henry's blue clothing was decorated with waves of gold, interpreted as declaring his mastery of the seas around England. Francis had a more abstract message linked to his salamander badge that was gradually spelled out over the course of the days of the joust, and which had to be explained precisely to the English observers. The Hampton Court painting shows massive crowds gathering at the tournament ground to watch the jousting. This record gives some indication of the effort the English put into event security and the management of the people attending. The Duke of Buckingham and the Earl of Northumberland headed the English judges on the field, but it was the Earl of Essex who had prepared the fighting ground who looked after a team of marshals and members of the King's Guard whose job it was to patrol the outer ditches and keep out strangers and vagabonds. Ten of the English Guard and ten of the French controlled the gates and screened who might enter. Sir Henry Marney managed the King's tent during the tournament, supplying fruit and drink to keep him refreshed during the fighting. Refreshment of another kind was also a concern, since part of the Marshal's role was to keep the English and French apart, so that none shall not intermeddle with the other for the avoidance of debate. Henry had prepared himself well for the foot combat at which he excelled. In good time, he asked a craftsman based at the new armories at Greenwich to make him a body-hugging suit of articulated armour that protected him completely. Not wishing to be outshone by this innovation, Francis insisted that the fighting on foot should be at the barriers, rather than on the open tourney ground as Henry had expected. Fighting in this way required wearing of a flared armoured skirt or tonlet to protect the thighs and groin. Henry conceded, as he had to, and a revised suit was quickly made for him and shipped over from Greenwich. Both of these armours survive at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. As the hosts, the English spent a year purchasing weapons, staves and accessories and preparing them for tournament fighting, a process that included blunting, lightening and hollowing swords, lances, maces or axes. A workshop was built at Calais and 24 armourers headed a team that was on constant duty to maintain the flow of equipment to the field once the competition started. Horses were also sourced from around Europe in the months before the event, with heavy courses for the tilt and more agile Spanish genets for the tourney. These later 16th century pictures show fighting with blunted and dulled tournament swords at the barriers. The marshals and judges paying close attention controlled the flow of the competition and point scoring. The foot combat at the Field of the Cloth of Gold came after the mounted tourney and was held on the last two days of the event. Fighting at the barriers also prevented Henry from using his strength to wield his two-handed sword, since it was alleged that few could withstand his blows, even in their best armour. Challenges and competitions in wrestling and archery among groups of courtiers filled days either side of a storm which smashed down many of the tents on Wednesday the 13th of June. The French king seemed uninterested in seeing the English skill with the longbow, but he might have got the better of Henry in a wrestling match, although no English source mentions such a contest between the kings, which a French commentator noted, with Francis as the victor. As hosts to the French, the English could spare no expense in the supply of food and drink, entertainments, dances, masks and other curious distractions which included the flying pyrotechnical dragon kite that swooped down on the royal couples and their courtiers as they left a final mass on Saturday the 23rd of June. 
expert on the field of the cloth of gold, historian Glenn Richardson, has calculated that 12,000 people were dined and kept content over the two weeks that the field lasted. The figure shown here, for the costs of the departments of the English royal household, covered a six-week period that included another meeting with Charles V, and although the figure was eventually reduced to around £7,400, it still indicates the staggering amount of food and provisioning that was delivered through Calais and Guine, with some meat and grain also bought from French suppliers. As guests, the French also had to reciprocate hospitality in kind, and without the issue of any insult to English cuisine or entertainment. Over the course of two weeks, mixing formal Sunday banquets with smaller scale personal meals and having the Queen's host feasts too, the kings dined as equals, with no difference in their status. Masks and dancing in Guin and Ard were carefully planned to reach a height of fashion and sophistication in costume, music and refreshments. Both Henry and Francis were athletic and very enthusiastic dancers. Even the ceremonies for the formal departure of the courts on the 24th of June featured people dressed as the Nine Worthies and other heroes of antiquity, offering inspiring rhetoric on chivalry, ancestry and peace. The spontaneous, casual and formal giving of expensive and personal gifts was another expected feature of the socialising between the leaders of both nations. From horses to gilt and jewelled plate, both kings and queens ensured that the prevalence of gold and silver continued in dining spaces, semi-public chambers and private closets, as well as the public grounds. As with his New Year's gifts, Henry planned ahead in purchasing thousands of pounds worth of goldsmith's work from London manufacturers in the months before June 1520. The final costs on both sides were outlandish. The price of the English expedition is estimated at around £35,000, close to the value of a national grant of taxation by Parliament. And we have to ask, was the field of cloth of gold worth the expense and what did it achieve? The field of the cloth of gold is still seen by many as a colossal waste of money that only heightened the personal rivalry between Henry and Francis and Charles V. The agreements of 1518, which the meeting celebrated, were soon unravelled as European politics linked to the Italian wars and the emerging forces of the Reformation changed the priorities of national leaders. However, personably, the kings got along at the field. Competition and rivalry were never far from the surface in the stressful requirement to observe equality of status and avoid the giving of personal or national offence. Francis pushed these boundaries of tact and common sense more often than Henry. Most memorably, on the 17th of June, he rode with a few companions into English territory and demanded entry into Henry's chamber in Guin Castle. When he banged on the chamber door and entered, he helped Henry to dress. All presented as an act of friendship and trust, but potentially divisive as an assertion of his right to invade the national and personal space of his royal rival. Francis took this confidence away from the field very pleased with the way the English had underlined his personal power. The event certainly left a larger hole in the resources of Henry than it did in the King of France's finances. As implied already, though, the proximity of the three kings allowed Wolsey to speed up his plans and negotiations for a formal alliance between England, France and Burgundy, Spain. This looked unlikely to happen by the time Henry hosted Charles at Calais on the 11th of July, where they agreed to maintain all treaties and alliances already in place between them. That this meeting, and Charles' brief stopover at Dover at the end of May before the field, had happened at all, was a result of Henry's agreement to meet with Francis on equal terms. Charles was worried that this friendship might deepen to the disruption of his own power in the Netherlands. The field had put England fully into the European diplomatic picture. Yet the field and its focus on England's political position had also only paused the rivalries between Charles and Francis in Italy over claims to rule Milan and the Kingdom of Naples. Over the winter of 1520, conflict flared once more and all states were once again compelled to think about the terms on which they would take sides. 
The Universal Peace of 1518 seemed to dissolve by the summer of 1521, as war became inevitable, despite Wolsey's efforts. England was soon firmly allied with Charles V against Francis, cemented by Charles's visit to England in May to July 1522. A three-year war with France then followed, in which Charles V became the dominant power in Europe. With the capture of Francis at the Battle of Pavia in 1525, Charles became almost overmighty. Politics then turned once again, as Henry looked to rebuild an alliance with Francis to check the Holy Roman Emperor. The Field of the Cloth of Gold might seem to have been an expensive and brilliant interlude in the swirling political changes of the 1520s, but in an age of personal monarchy, it was important in cementing a personal connection that became a common anchor for Henry and Francis, as their troubled relationship continued in a pattern of alliance and hostility until they died within three months of each other at the start of 1547.